Hi everyone, welcome to the Sleigh Ride Sal finishing tutorial. This is Nicole and today we are going to finish this beautiful sled for the Cherry Hill Stitchery Jingle Bell Sleigh Ride co-stitch that we've been working on the last four weeks. Right now I'm unpackaging the sled. This is from Chantal's 141 Design. This is the large sled. There is also a small that I have finished the Merry Christmas Cherry Hill Stitchery fit stitch on that you have likely seen in other videos. And there is also the ornament size. The large sled comes with two pieces. Right now, we're going to start working on the background piece. I have some masking tape here. This is actually some tape I have um, that is a tape I use for card making, holding dies in place and things like that, but it's in my craft room, so I'm going to go ahead and use it to mask off a part of the sled that I don't want to ink up. Now that big rectangular piece in the center is actually where the layering piece goes, so if I get some ink on it, it really does not matter, which is totally fine. But everything else on the background is going to be inked with a red color of ink. Today's technique is involving some ink pads that my paper crafters maybe already have on hand. This is the Lumberjack Plaid Distress Ink from Tim Holtz. Now you can stain directly with these ink pads. He also has re-inkers, so if you wanted to do a more traditional route, their re-inkers would be fantastic to just apply with like a foam brush or a rag or something. I think a rag would probably absorb an awful lot of the ink, um, but you could do it that way, or you can just do direct to the wood with your ink pad like I'm doing here. Now this is really super bright. It's not going to stay bright. I'm going to show you how I distress this up. Now I do want to mention that I started using the big pad and I switched to the small pad. The small size, the mini ink pad, I don't see that it is available yet. I received the small one in a kit at some point. You don't have to have the small one. Um, and I switched to that. I wish I had realized it, that it was not available for purchase or I would have just stuck with the large pad. It's not a big deal. I probably would have needed to add a little bit more tape. So be aware of that if you choose to go the same route. The reason this is so fantastic is look how fast you can apply the ink with these ink pads. And as I mentioned, there are re-inkers. So if you're worried about using up all your ink, just know that I've used these ink pads since I finished this for paper crafting. I just uh, applied a few drops of the re-inker to the ink pad and went on my way. So it's not a big deal. As long as your wood piece is really well sanded, you should be fine. Next, I have some ground espresso and walnut stain ink. These are also Tim Holtz. These do come in the mini size. These are very readily available. Now there are some other colors of red ink from Tim Holtz out in the marketplace that do come in the small size. Um, Barn Door and Candy Apple are two I'm thinking of. This one is Lumberjack Plaid. This was my personal favorite red, but you could use a different red. We're gonna, we're covering it up, or not covering it up, we're deepening and darkening it with the darker colors. So look at how messy I am going over the top of this. It doesn't even look good now at all with those darker colors of ink, but we want to add it. And then I'm gonna go back with my red ink pad and I'm going to smooth it out. I do find if you let your ink absorb into the wood just a little bit, you can get a little bit smoother application, but I really wanted to just show you um, the technique and the how I'm going about this. Black soot also could be used, and it's one of my favorites for paper crafting or uh, finishing like this. I stuck more with the brown shades today. Ground Espresso is a pretty dark color. And I'm trying to add that dark color where I naturally, naturally think the runners of the sled would be a bit darker. Now, these are water-based inks. I do want to caution you that it is best to apply a sealant when you are completely finished so that you don't run the risk of the, the uh, finish perhaps getting wet and running. I just like a matte clear coat 
I use it out of a spray bottle. Um, I think I used Krylon matte finish for this. I did not do it on camera. I did it out in a well ventilated area outside. So next I am taking my Walnut Stain ink and we are going to cover the top part of our sled. We will go back to the background piece. Again, this is a two piece set from 141 Design and this piece I want it to look like wood. It already has the great score marks in the wood and we really want to play off of that and showcase the fantastic texture and design. I want it to look like an actual old wood sled, even though this is a new piece. That's kind of my goal here. Now, I, if you want it to be even like kind of crustier and, and older looking, you could go ahead and sand it more after you've applied all the ink and it's dried and everything before you seal it. I am not gonna do that today. I want it to just kind of give it that older, darker, deeper look with the inks. Now, did I worry too much about those light areas in the center? I did not. Um, I, I covered it with ink, but I, I know I missed a few little areas. The stitch is going here. I'm not gonna worry about that. I want to concentrate on the top and the bottom of my sled. Now, you may have noticed in the photos at the beginning of the video, as well as any photos I've shared on social media, that there is not a layer of fabric under this stitch like there is on the Merry Christmas one. When stitching on a 28 count fabric, there really didn't allow for a lot of border on this particular design. So I will be adding some decorative touches with other um, supplies and other products rather than matting this on another piece of fabric. If you stitched on a 32 count, you can probably put a layer of fabric underneath here, but I just did not feel that it was necessary. It would have taken it at least clear to the edge, maybe further, and you don't always have to have fabric underneath. Um, so definitely just kind of play around with it and see what you like best. Now this is the ground espresso. Notice how I'm taking it down the score lines of the board and kind of pulling it from the top and the bottom. I want to deepen and darken those areas, uh, really bringing attention to it. Look at how rich, how beautiful this is starting to look. I just kind of always consider it, keep adding layers, keep working on it, keep, um, adding color until you're happy with it. So I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to kind of let it dry for a little bit. It does dry pretty quickly. I did all of this in one setting. So I did want to mention that. So I'm going to go back in. We're going to add a little more color now to the red runners of our sled. Um, darkening with the ground espresso more, especially around the edges. But you can definitely tell from the beginning of the video where I started applying the Lumberjack plaid and it was so incredibly bright red that it's deepened and darkened to a very beautiful texture. So now I'm going over with Walnut Stain, kind of blending out that darkest color and then going back with my Lumberjack plaid. You probably would not have to do it this many times. I was trying to get a specific look and I tend to be what I like to call for all my card makers extra. <laughs> so I'm just going over it until I'm happy. And that is what I suggest for all of you is to take your time with your finish. I think I have mentioned this in most of my finishing tutorials here, but we take so many hours with our stitching um, that it doesn't take near as much time to finish. And because of that, take your time with the finish so that you are left with something beautiful that you love when you're done. Okay, I am pulling off my masking tape. Now, some of the red bled into a couple of areas. I must not have had the tape very down very well, or I just pressed too hard, which is very likely. That's okay. I am going to run my brown ink along these sides just in case. Um, I'm not going to cover the whole thing, but the top part of the sled should cover this, but I just want a little brown ink along the sides. You can see this poor ink pad is uh, needing a re-inker pretty bad, but there's still so much ink in there, just around the sides. I'm not gonna need to cover the whole thing. Now, this other area, 
that I masked off, I am going to go in and add my walnut stain and ground espresso so that this has the same brown wood stain look that the sled itself has. I don't need to mask it off. I've used my brown shades in everything else on this stitch or stitch on this finish. So it's just going to blend into that. I don't mind if I get a little bit more of my walnut stain onto the red. If it does bother you, you can always make sure that the red part is nice and dry before you go ahead and start applying um, the darker color, pardon me. So I have done that here. I kind of gave it a few minutes. Oh, whoops. Mask the right part there, Nicole. And I do want to just mask a tiny bit where I think I might get a little too much of the ground espresso. And I'm going to add a little bit of that darker color. Just deepen and darken the wood stain part. We want it to match the rest. This actually is going to show quite a bit more uh, not a ton, but, but quite a bit more than the rest of it because the stitch obviously goes on the large rectangular piece. The stitch is smaller than this piece, so I am going to move it down and then we're going to add a nice big bow to fill in the rest of the area. And then we're going to have some nice greenery and Christmas picks coming out the top. Now, as this was stitched in July, it is now August and we may not be thinking about Christmas and the stores are thinking about fall and Halloween, but Hobby Lobby is always a good source. They probably have Christmas out. I've heard from a lot of you that there's a lot of Christmas picks. The Christmas picks I'm using today are all from Hobby Lobby. They are from last year. Now, they usually bring back the same ones or similar ones, so I just encourage you to look at it as inspiration before you go out and get your own. And I encourage you, I looked for smaller picks, but we are gonna alter and cut them apart. If you have some wire cutters, or if you don't have wire cutters, I guess I should say, I would recommend picking up a pair. They are a wonderful thing to have in your tool bag because it does allow you to cut stems and things like that down, which is what I'm gonna do so that everything flows and lays nicely. Oh my goodness, it's looking so fantastic. So I'm really happy with it at this point. And we are ready to add some finishing touches and then of course spray this. Now, before I add the finishing touches, I'm gonna to lay these out so you can see these. My paper crafters have probably already seen these if you are a fan of Tim Holtz. The inks I used are Tim Holtz, and these are called, I think they're called machine heads, but of course they look like screws, but they're not. They're flat back, so they're great for embellishment. They perfectly fit these, these uh, die lines on the sled, giving it the look of an actual sled. My goal is always to turn my finishes into something that looks like you purchased it at a store uh, to finish on, even though we are completely custom finishing this from start to finish. Well, I guess we didn't cut it. Chantal or one of her girls <laughs> cut this board, but you guys know what I mean. So uh, my glue wouldn't come out of the tight bond. I highly recommend tight bond. This was a recommendation from Chantal for assembling wood pieces. This is not uh, something I came up with, but it is fantastic. So I actually had to squirt it out and then I used my fingers to rub it around a little bit so it wasn't globbed up so bad. And then I attach my wood pieces. Now what I like to do, this is some trays that have dies and stamps in them. I have set these on top to smash those two pieces together. Just make sure that your bottom piece doesn't shift and move. Okay, I'll admit this is days later, okay? <laughs> this was not done in the same day. In between attaching the top piece to the bottom piece, I have taken my piece outside. I sprayed the entire thing with a clear coat, of, clear finishing coat. Again, I will link what I use down below and uh, I just didn't share it on camera. I highly recommend, please do it outside in a well-ventilated area. But it has a clear coat on both the front and the back. I did ink the back. If you choose to ink the back, this is the first time I've actually ever finished one of the backs of these pieces. Um, no, it's not gonna be as smooth as the front. 
so you really don't need to do it if you don't want to. I used E6000 to attach these metal machine heads and I do want to tell you if you choose to do that make sure you let it lay flat for plenty of time so those completely dry. It does take a little bit for E6000 to dry. They can decide to migrate. Ask me how I know when I set it up vertically and I came back days later a couple of them had moved. I did fix it before the video. How you may ask because it seems like they'd be stuck heat it up with a heat tool until it softens the glue a little bit and then if you have a straight edge razor I just pried it up and I was able to re-glue them. I know completely extra but I was happy to have found that that worked. Accidents do happen. Now I am taking a ruler and I'm simply cutting down my stitch. So let's cut it out of the fabric. Look at that. I got Slayville's ring all finished. There's a little sneaky peek. Um, I have trimmed this down. Now I trimmed it pretty close because I don't want to wrap a ton of fabric around. I already know this about myself. I don't like to wrap tons of fabric. I've done it a couple of different ways. Um, so now I've got my wool pressing mat. I also have the pressing cloth to protect my stitches. I did spritz the back of this with a little bit of Better Press spray just to get all of the wrinkles out. I would like to say do this at your own risk, everyone, because they do not recommend wetting over dyed floss. So if you used over dyed, I, you know, be careful. I like to live on the edge. I did not saturate my fabric. I've done this before, so it wasn't my first time, and I was really, really careful. So it's got hardly any liquid on it, but enough that will help allow me to get this nice and smooth. I'm using my little Oliso mini craft iron. I absolutely love my little craft iron. Oh, look at that stitch. I love this stitch so much. I cannot wait to see how it looks on the sled. Now, you may have noticed that I on this piece of press on board, I wrote eight and three quarters by seven and a half inches. With my tape measure, I was measuring the furthest point of my stitch on both sides, and I am going to trim down my press on board for my stitch. So that is what I'm doing here. The Tim Holtz Tonic Guillotine Trimmer. It is, a, it is an investment. Uh, especially if you're not a paper crafter. If you're a paper crafter, it's also an investment, but it's a fantastic one. But it does cut through the press on board and it's probably my favorite thing because I was having so much trouble. Then I'm going to cut a couple of pieces of batting. My personal preference for batting is two layers, but I use uh, warm and white or warm and natural. Warm and white's what I have here and it's thinner. If you're using a poly cotton blend of batting, I say you might be able to get away with one piece or maybe your personal preference is one piece of batting anyway and not two. Do what feels good to you, everybody. This is just what I like. Oh, and that's just not even good cutting. I'm just gonna cut those the same size. These are my scrap pieces of batting that I have in my stash left over from quilting projects. I keep a bunch of them because I always have something that then that I can use for finishing. Okay, so next I'm gonna peel off the sticky layer and that means one piece of batting is going to stick to the press on board and the other piece is gonna set on top. That's okay with me because um, we're gonna wrap our fabric around and secure it. Now, if you are going to lace your piece, I should have mentioned this when I trimmed down my stitch, I would leave more of a border. I am not today. We're going to do it the quick way. I, I like both. I think it's completely up to you. I don't mind using the tape. We're going to use the finishing tape from Fat Quarter Shop and the finishing circles. It is very quick and easy. I do recommend before you secure anything, what I like to do is I take some of these clover binder, binding clips, and I clip my finish to the board. This allows me to see, do I need to adjust? Do I need to move it left or right? Do I need to move it up or down? Is it not even? I noticed it wasn't even. I noticed that especially the dashing through the snow was what I noticed the most. It was going kind of at a crazy downward angle on one side, so I'm smoothing it out. You can still smooth it out as you start attaching it to the board. 
But I did want to mention that I do try to make all of those adjustments at this point so that I can visually see it. If you're like me and you're a visual type of stitcher and you're a visual stitcher and you need to see it before you commit, <laughs> then I recommend this because this allows you to see it and see I'm adjusting. I, I don't like it. Take the time to adjust this right now. It is worth it. So I've removed the clips from that side. I'm kind of straightening, smoothing, and then we're gonna grab our, our finish piece and look at it. How does it fit? Does it look good on the finish piece? There's really no more that I can cut down along those long sides. So we are ready to start attaching. Now, as I mentioned, we're not gonna lace today. I am using the finishing circles and tape from Fat Quarter Shop. I'm using the large circles. I place those in the corner, fold the corners down, then I use the tape along the sides. So we're gonna do the two long sides and then we'll do the two short sides. And what I'm looking for is as nice a corner as I can possibly get. I want it to be nice and tight at that corner. And the great thing about these circles and tape, you can pull it up. If you were using hot glue, it's not gonna be as easy to pull those corners up. That is one of the reasons I really love using these is it allows me to kind of fiddle with it, work with it and get this as tight as possible, as smooth as possible without ruining my stitch. And to me, that's the goal. Now you can also get this and achieve a very beautiful finished look with lacing. I did lacing in the More Chocolate Bunnies tutorial, which is here on my channel. See how it's all lumpy bumpy along that side? We need to fix that. Um, but most of the time, this is how I finish. And just do your favorite way. So I'm gonna flip it over now before I do another side. I like to check it out. I'm still not happy. It's still kind of crazy. Pull, pull nice and tight. You don't wanna pull the stitch, but you wanna have it very nice and taut. And that already looks so much better. Make sure your stitch doesn't have any little flakes. You can always kind of take a lint roller or sticky roller brush when you're all finished. Okay, I'm gonna flip over. We're gonna do the other long side. We're gonna put our big circles in the corners. Tape, wrap tightly. And I know I have shown this before, but I really like in my finishing tutorials, maybe you haven't seen any of those videos before, I like to take you really from start to finish, except for things that I may have to do uh, in a well-ventilated area. <laughs> uh, even then, I do try to share those sometimes. I just didn't share the, um, the clear coat finish. Regular stain also would work. Um, so if you feel more comfortable or you have regular stain in your stash, you can for sure use that. I meant to mention that earlier. Um, just kind of make it your own. Okay, let's pull up this side. I probably could have trimmed this side down a little closer, but I didn't. So there's that. And again, we want to pull tight. We want the corners to be as tight as possible. Maybe pull that up a little smooth pull tight. It's actually looking pretty good. Smooth out the stitch. Make sure none of the text especially or any straight line or if this had a border, it doesn't really have a border around the stitch, but this is a good time to make sure it's not all wonky before you start securing those remaining two sides. Now I will tell you I am going to hot glue this piece to my board. So would I really be able to pull it off and redo it? Mm, maybe, maybe not. It's probably, probably not. If you don't want that to be a possibility, I would not hot glue this to your finishing board. Mine is going to stay just like this, so that's okay with me. And I'm just going to work on those corners. Not loving that one, so let's fiddle with it. I spend... Uh, quite a bit of time fiddling with corners and fiddling with this because if your stitch doesn't look good, the finish isn't going to look good. So take your time with this step. Uh, I know this is all 
the video I think is condensed and it is sped up of course, but it's condensed into about 50 minutes. The actual finishing took uh, multiple days. I did the staining and then, I mean, I walked away. I did the staining and several days later, I ended up going out and spraying it. I did let the, the stain or the ink absorb into the wood for probably almost a week, you guys. You don't need to let it be that long. That's just what worked out. Then I sprayed it with a clear coat on a Sunday and I glued down after it was dry, I glued down the machine heads or the, the little screw looking things, the flat back screws, and then I let it sit until the finishing. And then I did do all the finishing in one day. So it did take multiple days. Okay, here is our sled. Now see how our stitch is, especially if I have it the other direction, it's way smaller than the board in the center, but that's okay. We are going to make it look amazing. So this is actually leftover ribbon from my Merry Christmas stitch. You guys have seen it probably, but I had it down in my finishing bucket, my Christmas finishing bucket purchased from Hobby Lobby uh, in 2022. They may have something similar this year. So I first, this is how I make my bows. The first piece I've notched the ends. The second piece, I cut another piece and I'm just going to fold it over. Right now, this is a wire edge ribbon, so I can just kind of leave it sitting here. And then, let's grab that piece. We are going to cut another piece about two inches smaller in length. So let's take the first one, and I'm gonna lay that there. And the how I gauge this is the notched piece I want it to fit the board and then I make the loops to fit on top. This is how I make a faux bow is what I call this. So let's set that aside for a minute. Now this is back to there is not enough room for fabric underneath this layer, but I want some sort of a decorative edge. I have say some Aleens or Aleens, I don't know how you say it, glue. And this is some twine I had in my stash. This is a kind of thicker twine. You can find this in most craft stores. Again, I think this actually came in a kit, a card kit at some point that I didn't use and I threw in my finishing drawer. This is not a twine I personally would probably use for card making, but I knew that it would be great for finishing. So instead of a fabric layer, I am gluing this around the edge of my stitch. I am wrapping it around and I'm gonna glue it down. Now, I am going to move my sled out of the way. I noticed as I was doing this that this was probably stupid. If I dripped glue on this or smeared something, I was gonna be mad at myself. So I will be moving this out of the way. I am using my Clover Wonder Clips to kind of help hold this down while it dries. Be warned, this is going to take a little bit to dry and I'm running a bead of glue, clipping it, and then I'm gonna set it aside while I kind of work on the rest of the design. Um, and then I'll kind of come back. If you see some glue there, it will dry clear um, and you're never going to know. So that, that for me, if this is something that bothers you, I would not do it this way, maybe glue it directly to the board. But for me, I liked the little rustic look this added to the finish. It kind of matches the vibe of our sled, it matches the ribbon, and kind of more of that rustic classic feel that I was looking for. And I'm just gonna slowly work my way all the way along, and here I'm like, yeah, probably better move that sled. Not a good plan. Okay, and I'm gonna continue doing this all the way around. The, this glue is fantastic. If you are doing pillows and you do not like to uh, hand sew your trim on, I personally do like doing that, strangely enough. Um, but if you don't, I know so many stitchers who when they finish their pillows, they glue on their chenille trim or their rickrack trim or anything like that. So that is another option. And I'm really loving this trim. I was a little worried that I wasn't gonna love it, especially after doing all this stitching. But you know, sometimes you just dive in. <laughs> 
but I think it turned out really, really pretty. I like it a lot. The other thing I'm going to add for my finishing and my bow, there's a couple of ways to do the bow. You could put a small piece of the ribbon in the center, wrap it around, gather, gather your bow, which you'll see me do here in a minute, wrap the ribbon around and glue it in the back to make it look like a, a bow that you've tied, but only prettier because tying bows never turns out that great. At least it doesn't for me. Or I love a button finish in the center. You guys know this. And what I ended up doing was taking one of the larger snowflakes from this stitch and I stitched it in red on a scrap of the fabric from this stitch. The thing is, is the snowflakes in this stitch are not that big. And so I ended up just kind of making up my own little design <laughs> and I extended it so that it would fit the bigger button. If I was going to use a smaller button for this stitch, the one I used would probably have been fine or the, the snowflake shape. I could have used a smaller button, but I didn't personally, um, I just didn't like it. So uh, I, I made it a little bigger. I felt like this bow required a bigger button. Okay, I'm running a bead of hot glue. You could use Aileen's as well. The hot glue is going to dry quicker on my loops, especially with a wire edge ribbon. This works really, really well. So just a tiny bit. We're making our bow. So there is our layers. Then I like to use a nice strong thread. I guess I'm switching back and forth. I was letting that dry a little bit before I finish off the stitch. Oh, and I do want to mention the reason I finished this off at the top, it's going to be hidden with the rest of the embellishments we add. We're going to have the bow right above this. And I feel like um, it just helps hide things. A little bit better instead of having it finished down at the bottom so that's why I have it connected up at the top okay sorry felt forgot to mention that and I think that's going to look fantastic on the board I'm very very excited okay now back to our bow well let's see how it looks first I like it I think it fits great so our bow and our greenery. We're gonna come back to the bow here in a minute because I actually didn't stitch the finish until later. So again, I do wanna mention all of these picks I had from last year. I have a bucket per season of finishing items that I like to go grab when I am ready to do some finishing. And you can't really cut these with scissors. So I'm going to go grab my wire cutters I've had forever and I'm going to snip right down below. This actually snipped this red frosted berry into three pieces and that it does allow me to adhere these a little differently to the board. No hiding them back behind the stitch. Um, I'm a I can kind of fan them out, I guess, is what how I want to say it a little bit more. Don't be afraid to cut up your greenery, your picks, whatever the case may be. The frosted greenery you see here, I also have some leftover pieces from when I cut apart one last year, but I wanted a little bit more to fill in this particular design. It's quite a bit bigger. So I cut one apart and I was able to, well, I think I left, used this leftover from another one, but I cut another one apart and I'm just going to tuck a couple of greenery pieces in here. It's a great way to add just little picks of greenery and different things to your finishes. Okay, I'm pretty happy with this. My glue is still drying. I've kind of got my picks and greenery all figured out. We've got our bow. So I moved back and forth a lot in this finish. I'm sorry, it's kind of all over the place, but we want to gather it. Look how beautiful, you can see the beauty and how pretty this is going to be. So I just, I wanted to have, see if the binder clip would hold it so I could kind of visualize how the finish will look, but nope. And I also, I had some jingle bells. You can kind of see them in the screen. Those are a little too clean and perfect. I've used those. I think I used those on the, um, the hot cocoa, the old fashioned stitch along that we did. But I, I decided I had another purchase 
we are going to use something else today and they are rusty jingle bells and that is really what i was looking for for this stitch i purchased mine from amazon i will add those to um, the description if you're interested in picking them up they are also used for the ornament finish and i really really love them all right so off camera i went and stitched up myself a little snowflake design I'm going to trim this. This is the one and an eighth inch button shape. That's just a scrap of fabric. I will link to the button tutorial down below that I've done on my channel on how I like to do these. If you prefer, you can take some fabric and make a fabric covered button if you don't want to do a stitch. I love, I love how the look of a little stitch looks in the center of my bows. Then we're going to make our button. I, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail in the video with this, and I'll just link to the button making tutorial. But I want to have my button ready to go so that when I gather up my bow, I am able to finish it right then and there. This does have a shank on it. And so I like to go ahead and sew that into my bow finish. And what this does is it does end up hiding the center part of the bow. I do have a little bow tutorial. I will also link to that down below here on my channel, which was a little simplified, but it very much is how I do these bows. This is some crochet thread, so it's super strong. You do not need to use crochet thread, probably. this, But I do like it because it's, like I said, it is super strong and I have it in my stash. And what I'm doing is I am doing a running stitch. This is not a cross stitch needle. This is a regular strong like crafting needle. I am running a running stitch through the center of my bow. It doesn't have to be super fancy, but what we're looking to do is gather this up and gather it so that it, it gives you that illusion of a bow that is tied. And this is my favorite way to make a bow. My absolute favorite way to make a bow because I cannot tie a decent bow this size. I can't make one like this. I can do a little bow. I have a little hack for that. And Chantal has a new bow making tool. But for my big bows, I love doing them this way. So then when I get that gathered, I end up taking the tail and I like to wrap it around the center of my bow to just kind of secure it a couple times. And then I'm going to bring that same needle with the same crochet thread up through the center. And I'm going to go through my button and then I'm gonna go back down through the center to the back of the stitch. You could do this a couple times if you want to. Uh, you probably don't have to. Once is probably enough. And then I take it through the back and we are going to knot this. So I would do that a couple times, give it a nice little knot, and then I'm going to hot glue this to my board here in a minute. That's all there is to it. And you are left with a beautiful, professional looking bow that is just perfect for the stitch. I particularly love this ribbon. I hope they still have, or they have it again this year. I think it looks great with cross stitch fabric. I, it, I really do. This is the same ribbon I used on Merry Christmas. Okay, I'm actually gonna take a little bit more of my string and I did just sew in these rusty jingle bells into the bottom of that bow. All I did was just sew them in like I did the button. I just sewed them to the back so that they hang right there right below and for me the jingle bells and they do jingle match the jingle bell theme everything i i did here was to match the theme and the finish my aileen's glue is dry you can see that you're not seeing any of that residue we're gonna i have some glitter <laughs> left from those beautiful picks, but they leave a glitter mess i'm gonna put hot glue on the back of my finishing board my press on board with the finish and we are gonna glue our stitch down. We have reached the full assembly 
phase of this operation. Now I've left um, an inch, inch and three quarters down at the bottom. You can see I kind of lined it up with the bottom of that straight edge, like maybe just about a quarter of an inch above that because above, then it leaves me plenty of room to have picks sitting up high above the stitch. My whole goal is to make this look um, scaled correctly. So I moved my stitch down, leaving just a tiny bit of the sled. I want that to show. And then I'm hot gluing my picks. And this is where cutting off the stem of the picks comes in so handy because it's gonna lay nicely. And I'm just kind of trying to twist up my picks and give it that beautiful natural look. There's three pieces to red. That, that was only one pick that I cut apart, by the way, that red pick. And really the greenery would just be one pick, but I used leftover from, an, from one I'd already cut up and then I had to cut up another one. So you really only need two picks to fill this whole area if you're gonna pick up something similar. Now I did try to glue them all kind of in the center because the goal is then to put the bow where it hides that hot glue on the board. And I'm gonna put hot glue on the back of this. And then we're going to press that right where our greenery meets. And you wanna maybe hold that down while the hot glue is drying just a little bit so that stays put. That's the only place I want hot glue. Then you can kind of fuss and mess with the bow once that is nice and secure. Fluff the loops of your bow up, get those jingle bells kind of where you want them to go, hanging correctly. And again, I just sewed those down into the bow to hang right there. Maybe tuck the tails underneath some of the greenery and the picks and things. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm loving it so, so, so much. <laughs> I was really happy that this worked out um, as I had envisioned in my head. This does have quite a bit more greenery and picks than the Merry Christmas, which was, of course, the inspiration for this finish. And the reason is there is a lot more room on the large sled, but I needed the large sled for the size 28 or 14 count finish of the stitch. Okay, I have a little bit thinner jute twine, and then I have some finishing beads. I am going to link, if, if not to these exact beads, because they do go in and out of stock, but something similar, I did get them through Amazon. I've had these since last year. I am gonna repeat the pattern of green, red plaid, red, all the way across. This is completely optional, but I want it to be like the, the hanger I may just lean this for decorative purposes, but I love the look of the beaded hanger. It does take quite a few. This is much bigger. The ornament took nine. This is going to take quite a few more than that. I did not count how many. Uh, they come in a huge sack. Now, this is some cheap twine from Hobby, no, from Michaels. And I do find it frays a lot. I probably could have put a little Aileen's on the end of this and, and let it dry or some tape maybe to run it through these, but I just cut off the, the very tiny tip of it every time it frayed. So um, when it would fray like it is right now, I would just snip that off. It's just a little tiny piece and I would rethread it. I will tell you, I was not happy with my first way of securing this to the board. The holes that I am putting this through on either side are quite a bit bigger than they were on the small sled. And I'm going to show you what I did and hated, and I'm gonna show you what how I fixed it after sleeping on it overnight. I came back the next morning and said, you know what, I can do better. And that's okay. Sometimes you, when you're finishing and you're trying to figure out how to make things work, you may have to come back later and adjust. So I am going to do just that, but I do wanna leave it in the video because I feel like uh, it's always good to share. Things don't always go perfectly the first time. And uh, give yourself grace and just know that usually there is a, a solution out there um, if you give yourself a little time to think on it. I love it. Here's, I just keep my beads in these jars. I'm looking to see if there's more plaid. I think I had to dip into my red and black jar, my red, black, and white bead jar. And again, I've not bought any beads this year, so these were just all left over from last year, and I'll 
see what I find that is similar. Okay, we are going to now knot this to secure each end. And I did knot it a couple times. And the reason I had to go to this thinner twine rather than the thicker that I used around my stitch, thicker is not gonna go through the beads well. Um, so I really like this thin twine. And again, I get mine at Michael's. I think probably Hobby Lobby has it as well um, or any discount store or probably Amazon. But I'm gonna secure it with those little knots. And then we're going to thread it through those two open holes on our stitch and just secure the beads with a couple of knots so they don't go flying off while you're working on the finishing portion. Okay, now I flipped or I threaded it through and what I ended up doing was I pulled the two ends together, tied it in a knot and hot glued it to the back. And I hated it at the time and I know that's a harsh word, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I went to sleep, I woke up the next morning and I was like, yeah, that's a no. I cannot stand it. I know no one's going to see it. That's the reason I did it. I thought, well, no one will see it. And you know, who cares? Um, but I care, I knew. What I had actually done in between finishing this and then fixing this, I had finished the sled. And when I finished the sled, I had knotted it multiple times. Well, the sled is quite a bit smaller. So you could make big knots that won't come back through those holes. Well, we are going to make that work here and I am gonna show you how. So let me flip this guy over. Oh my gosh, I love it. I'm still loving it. So it's okay that, that I didn't like what I did on the back. What I did was I took a straight edge rage, razor and I very, very carefully pried up that hot glue. So we are going to pry up the hot glue Oh, there's the two sleds side by side. I did want to show you that. We are going to pry up the hot glue, which I've already done. I did that out in my kitchen. And I did scrape off the rest of the residue and it didn't damage it at all, believe it or not. And I am going to knot. I am going to knot and knot and knot and knot some more. And if you don't have enough string, you can grab another piece of string and knot around this knot to make it nice and big. This, there's probably an easier way to do this, you guys, but this worked for me. This was me problem solving and making this work. So you can see I've run out of string, but I kind of feel like I'd like a knot or two more. Let's work on the other end. I had even less to work with on this one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna knot what we have, but then I am gonna take another piece of twine and I'm going to knot around this one. I didn't have to restring my beads. I didn't have to waste what I already had here. We're just going to grab another little piece, but make that knot big enough that it is nice and secure. So that is all I am doing. And when I'm finished, so that all these knots don't come unraveled or anything like that, I'm not gonna hot glue or glue the knot to the board, at least not at this point. I took some Aileen's glue and I'm just gonna put it over the knot itself to secure those ends and let that set and dry. Let that set up and dry, secure the twine hopefully, and we're gonna call that good. This is so much cleaner, so much prettier to me, um, but I, I wanted to make mention of that I, I could have cut it out of the video, but I kind of like showing you guys the whole process and my thought process and my problem solving <laughs> process. I hope that you find that helpful for when you're finishing your own stitches. This also shows you that I did ink the back of my board. It is rough. Uh, there's kind of what I call the A side and the B side. This is the B side. Maybe you prefer that. Uh, so you could definitely do that. It's not gonna have the score lines though. Um, and you can leave it unfinished. You do not need to finish it if you don't want to. Okay, so I'm gonna snip that up. We're gonna add some of the Aileen's glue. We're gonna let it dry and our finish is going to be all done. Thank you guys so much for joining me today for the Sleigh Ride Sal finishing tutorial. Thank you guys for stitching along with me. I absolutely love it. I love this community and I cannot wait to see all of you guys' finishes with this awesome stitch. Thank you for watching and the supplies are listed below. Bye everyone. 
If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel, click that like button, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to always be notified when I have a new floss tube stitching or quilting video. Thank you guys so much for joining me today, and we'll see you next time.